night, and I was thinking about things uh, that I've given up, that I regret that I gave up. And I, and I was thinking about all the things that I've given up, which isn't that many things. I still do quite a lot of things that I've always done, which maybe is a bad thing. I happen to think it's a good thing. One of the things I gave up that I wish I'd stayed with was I tried on two or three occasions to learn the guitar. Um, and it hurt my fingers, and I didn't understand music, and I couldn't get beyond smoke on the water, which isn't much use in worship. Um, and so I gave it up. But I would love to be able to play the guitar or do something like that, but it, it, it required a lot of work, and I couldn't do it. Uh, I also gave up jogging. I did that for a year uh, between the age of 20 and 21, and I do not regret giving that up. I have never wished to take up jogging again. Uh, it was deeply unpleasant for my body. Um, but I, I love walking, and I, I don't give that up. Um, but I was thinking about the things, the times, the things in life I feel like giving up and haven't given up. And I don't know what, a, what, what you put in the category. The things you've given up that you regret, maybe you were going to play the piano or the recorder or whatever it was, um, or the things that you think about giving up but don't give up. Um, many, many occasions. I have thought of giving up watching football. When you've traveled uh, five hours and stood in the rain and watched your team lose before nil down after 20 minutes, and you think, this is pointless. Why am I doing this? Why am I spending all this money? And then, once every 10 years, when your team gets to Wembley and wins a minor trophy, you think, this was worth it. And you look at the people who haven't stood uh, at Hartlepool and Morecambe and Fleetwood or wherever it is where we've got battered in the past and they've just come for the glory moment and I think this means more to me <laughs> and there's something about how things become precious when you don't give up but you wanted to and the question for tonight is whether for you the thought of giving up following Jesus is something that would worry you, or whether, well, I'm enjoying church in the moment, I'm enjoying Christianity in the moment, if I'm not doing it in 10 years' time, that doesn't matter, or whether there's something within you that goes, whatever it is, I want to hold on to this. Jesus says in a few moments, we're going to look at the verse, he says, I'm telling you this so that you don't fall away. Well, why would people fall away from following Jesus? And would that matter? There have been many times when I have felt like giving up on Jesus and I have felt like uh, walking away from this church, from any church, uh, I can remember two or three occasions where I felt like walking away halfway through a service and just going, that's it. I have a friend who did that. I had a friend who was halfway through his sermon and just said, just paused for a long while and said, I'm really sorry. This is rubbish. I'll leave. And did. And that has always stayed with me as an option. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we won't get there tonight. But I also am aware that for me... Early on in my Christian life, I realized that it was a distinct possibility that I might give up. And that has become a significant motivation to me to hold on. It seems ages since we've had a um, Charlie Brown cartoon. So let's have proper church and do that. Charlie Brown says, I hate to see the sun go down. I've wasted another day. I really love Charlie Brown, not because he's just follically challenged, but also because he identify with his, his sort of sense of failure and hopelessness. I hate to see the sun go down. I've wasted another day, he says to Linus. What do you consider a day not wasted? Now, what would you consider a day not wasted? 
What for you we go today? Because I would certainly identify with that feeling of thinking, what have I done today? What have I achieved? Where has it been? What has it gone? So what is the question? What uh, is a day not wasted? This is Charlie Brown's answer to a day not wasted. A day where I met the girl of my dreams, was elected president of our country and won the Nobel Prize and hit a home run. Now, I put it to you that that is unrealistic. (laughs) His expectations are here. And so because his expectations are here, every day is disappointing. He started with an illusion, an incredibly high standard. And so every day is disillusioned because his illusion has been dissed. Linus says, I can understand why you'd hate to see the sun go down. It's not realistic. And I wonder what our expectations are in following Jesus. What do we expect Jesus to do for us? Because Jesus tells the disciples something to stop them falling away, that we might not give up. This is in the context of remaining in God's love. These are all some of the previous talks that we've looked at. And he's chosen these 12 guys to follow him and to be the instruments of his blessing into the world. And we talked about uh, the fact that he says to them, and this is where we really get in the context now, he says, look, the world will hate you. And these are some of the things we've looked at earlier. You can find these on our YouTube channel, on our website. If you get podcasts, you can subscribe to Sun Colfer Baptist Church. You can listen to all these things in your leisure. And last time out, we looked about being chosen out of the world, and I did that with the kids. And he says, at the beginning of John chapter 16, we're going to jump on slightly because he's told them some things, and he says, all this I have told you, which is the beginning of chapter 16. Sometimes the chapter headings are not always in the right helpful place. We would put those in later. The original writers didn't have uh, chapters and verses. And I'm not quite sure why they put this as 16 verse 1, because really it's the end of 15. He says, look, I've told all of this that you would not fall away. He's saying to these 12, or 11, because we're not quite sure whether Judas is in the room or not. He says, guys, you've walked with me for three years, but there is a risk you could give it all up. It's a risk that you would fall away. So we're going to ask ourselves a few questions. What is falling away? What has Jesus warned them about? Why might they have fallen away if he hadn't warned them? What might cause us to fall away? And what can we do to stop ourselves falling away? So what is falling away? It is to no longer love Jesus. Now, there'll be debates about whether this is about losing our place in heaven. I don't think it is. I don't want to go into that particular debate. I think this is simply about losing a sense of love for Jesus, of no longer caring about him. And that leads to no longer listening to him or obeying him. One of the joys of being in a church for a long, long time and having overcome those moments when I want to walk out is when you see people grow and develop. And uh, I've had the privilege of being originally, initially a youth worker here and then leading the church and, and uh, married people I've dedicated uh, as babies. Uh, I didn't marry them, I got them married to other people. So it's, it's appropriate. <laughs> Uh, But just that length of time. However, one of the biggest problems with being around a long time is all the people who are not here, who are still living in and around Sutton Coalfield. At one point, we're in our evening or morning service. People I've baptised, people who came and worshipped and raised their hands and sometimes took roles of responsibility and leadership. And now they're going nowhere. And I found that deeply sad. And in my limited conversations, I've never found any of them who are glad about it. In fact, what I often hear from people is, I wish I could come back. 
I wish I could discover it again. How much would it matter to us if we were in a future, a future version of ourselves? If you could see yourself in a time machine and you could talk to yourself in 10 years' time, how much would it matter whether you are still seeking to listen and obey Jesus? And what would you say to yourself if you could see into the future and the moments when you think, I won't go anymore? Now, what tends to happen is that isn't a split decision. What tends to happen is that we leave it for a couple of weeks. And then as something happens for a couple more weeks. And then it's five or six weeks and then we feel awkward or embarrassed. It means more important than us not loving Jesus. It means that we don't fulfill the things that Jesus has given us breath for. And I know I say this a lot, but I passionately believe it. That God gives us life for a purpose. He calls. There are good works that he wants us to do, that he's created for us to do. There are things, conversations, people he wants us to bless and encourage. There are broken and damaged situations this week that he wants us to be a part of bringing hope and light into. And the moment we start to say, I don't care anymore and I'm not listening and I'm going to do my own thing, we're no longer in tune with the whispers of his spirit saying, say this, do this, go there, pick that up, lift that, make this, drive that. And then we do get to the end of the day and we go, what have I done? And the answer might be, well, you've done a lot of things, but you didn't do what I wanted you to do. And that, for me, is always the big fear, to do a lot of things, but not the thing I was meant to do. So what can we do to stop ourselves falling away, to find ourselves in a place where our life has become tiny and not what we had hoped for? Because this is a place of deep unhappiness. Deep unhappiness. Because once we set out and we say to Jesus, I want to live for you, then when we lose that or it comes in the background and we fall away, it's painful. So, what has Jesus warned them about? Why does he say, I'm telling you this so that you don't fall away? Well, very briefly, the second half of chapter 15, he is warning them that they're going to be persecuted. That just as he, that night, this is the last supper, just as he's about to go out, pray in Gethsemane, get arrested, get a kiss on the cheek from Judas and all that malarkey, then get taken to the, to the courts and, and whipped and beaten and a crown of thorns put on his head. He says to them, look, this is going to happen to you. There will be people who hate you. And we've looked at that in our previous time. Those who hate me will hate you as well. And he's saying this to the disciples. I don't want you to be surprised by this. And they need to not deny. You must stay a witness, a person who's able to say, despite what you say, this is the truth I've held and see. That my God loves me and calls me. And they will be excluded. They're going to be put out of the synagogue, the place of worship. They're going to be treated as uh, uh, um, uh, apostates, as people who, who don't believe the right things. And they're going to see Jesus die. They're going to see Jesus die within a couple of days. And he says, I don't want you to fall away. So why might they have fallen away if he hadn't said these things? Because it is to do with expectations. The expectations, certainly, of the disciples right up until this moment, and probably this was what right in the middle of them changing their expectation. The expectation was that, uh, remember, five days ago, they've come into Jerusalem, Jesus riding on a donkey, people throwing their palm leaves down, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They've got an a, a re- expectation that Jesus is going to be proclaimed king, probably that weekend. Certainly, that's what they thought on the Sunday. This is now Thursday. 
and maybe it's all getting being into question, but less than five days ago, they were convinced that Jesus was going to be proclaimed king. What that meant is that he was going to overturn and throw out the Roman occupation. So this tiny little vassal nation that had been subdued by empire after empire and tossed from place to place, that this place was going to be a triumphant beginning of a great new empire, and Jesus was going to be the king, and that he was going to defeat all their enemies. That was their expectation. That was the expectation of the crowds. That was certainly the expectation of Judas Iscariot. And that they were going to be his right-hand leaders. They'd argued about this, that Jesus was going to be the king. And they were going to, who was going to be number two? Who was going to be number three? Who was going to be number four? That's their expectation. And Jesus is shattering it. He is saying, I'm going to be hated. I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be killed And the good news is, it's going to happen to you as well. Lots of you will know Charlie Mackesy's book, The Boy, the Fox, the Mole, and the Horse, which I love to quote. I find a really great, great book. The greatest illusion, said the mole, is that life should be perfect. And I've seen that damage way, way, way too many Christians. Because disillusionment is what happens when we have false expectations. And disillusionment leads to resentment and disbelief. God, where are you? God, why haven't you done this? Why has my prayer not been answered? Why is life difficult? Why am I unwell? Why do people hate me? Why am I not seeing people come to faith? Why is my church not growing? When we start with an illusion of success. Because one of the difficult things to understand about following Jesus is he says, take up your cross and follow me. And the cross is defeat. Yes, there's resurrection. But he says, come with me through defeat. Paul talks in Philippians about having fellowship, sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. If we have an illusion that following Jesus is easy, we'll give up in five years. So what would cause us to fall away? Well, it could well be the anger or disappointment or disbelief in Jesus. Here's the deal. And I know this doesn't matter to half of you, but to the other half of us, it matters deeply. God cannot stop aging. I know it's disappointing. We will get more wrinkly. We will forget things. We will get slower. We will get balder. So will the men. It will happen to all of us. <laughs> and Jesus isn't going to stop it. Life is difficult. And if we misunderstand the suffering of Jesus, we'll fall away when things get tough, when things get difficult. Another uh, cartoon, this is Linus watching the stars at night, contemplating. Charlie Brown arrives and he says to Charlie Brown, if a star fell down here, would you be allowed to put it in a pail and take it home? Isn't that a great question? If a star fell, could you put it in a bucket or a pail and take it home? Charlie Brown says, well, in the first place, Linus, a star is pretty big, and you'd never be able to get one in a pail. You wouldn't? Nope. I'm afraid not, says Charlie Brown. Linus's hope that he would be able to catch a falling star and put it in his bucket, a shiny, beautiful thing, and take it home, that has been dashed by Charlie Brown's realism. And they sit for a while. (coughs) 
and Linus throws his bucket away. (laughs) What is it that we can do and say and prepare each other for that we don't throw the bucket away? That we don't give up on Jesus because it isn't what we thought it was going to be. False expectations lead to disillusionment. And not only disillusionment and resentment and anger and disbelief. And Jesus says, I want you to love me and I want you to see the beauty of serving me each day. I want you to see the wonder of, yes, maybe being rejected by some, but actually transforming lives. And, you know, we've had baptism here in the evening and we've had a baptism this morning here. When you are part of a baptism, when you know you've been part of a story, and a tiny little part of a story that is of transformation, that is of redemption, it is worth more than anything. It is worth more than all the sufferings that come from following Jesus. I've been a follower of Jesus for 45 or more years. And there have been times when it's been really difficult, but I would not swap it for anything. It has been worth it. Because when you can get to the end of a day or a week or a year and hear God say, well done, when you can see a life transformed, it is worth it. When you can see a prayer that you've prayed for somebody else and you see God answer it, it is worth it. Somebody sent me this card some time ago. Life is not about how fast, what does it say? Life is not about how fast you run or how high you climb, but how well you bounce. We need to have, be strong and resilient because if we have false expectations, then the moment the wind blows, there's a weak resilience. We need to cost out our faith. What is it going to cost to follow Jesus? It's going to cost you financially. You'll not be as rich by following Jesus as you would have been because God is going to ask you to share. You are not necessarily going to be as popular. But if you can count, and you may find it exhausting, but then life can be exhausting anyway. But if you can say, yeah, I'm prepared to live a little bit more simply, and I am prepared to be unpopular on occasions then what you get is an incredible sense of God's love and value and worth and purpose. And your life becomes what it was meant to be and significant. And so we mustn't have a weak resilience and uncosted faith or be unprepared for difficulty or to be afraid because things happen that we didn't expect. Charlie Mackesy's book, uh, he says, I'm going to read this one. Sometimes the horse, sometimes said the horse, sometimes what, asked the boy. Sometimes just getting up and carrying on is brave and magnificent. Maybe life's difficult right now. Maybe there's conflict. Maybe you're trying to do the right thing and it's not easy. Maybe you've done the wrong thing and you're struggling with the consequences or the shame or the issues of that and you don't quite know how to get yourself back. It's not how fast we go, it's how well we bounce and get back up again. What can we do to stop ourselves falling away? The most important thing is this, don't think we could never fall away. My, my, my experience would say that those who would say, I will never not love Jesus, you may be the people in 10 years' time that aren't here. But those of us who go, God, would you not let me go? Would you help me overcome? Would you give me strength when it's difficult, when it doesn't work out as I want? Will you help me? Linus is talking to Violet. He says, right after church next Sunday, we're all going on a picnic. 
This is the cartoon. We're not actually going on a picnic. It's going to be cold and wet next week. We haven't done, we do that in the summer. It's cold and wet in the summer as well, but that's when we do it. Anyway, she says, I, don't, uh, I didn't know your family belonged to a church, she says. He says, sure, doesn't yours? She said, they used to. Now they belong to a coffee house, coffee shop. If there's something within us that goes, God, not let that not be me. Let not my kids say of me, oh, they used to go to church when they were young. Oh, they used to go to church, but we don't anymore. How do we stop ourselves falling away? We need to expect difficulty, but focus on reward. He says, it is for your good that I'm going away. It is for your good that I'm about to be arrested. It is for your good that I'm about to die. Now, part of that is because he's saying that God's spirit is going to come and live within them, and we'll look at that next time. But another big part of that is he's simply saying, what I'm going to do on the cross is worth everything. And so part of what we need to do is focus on what is on the other side of our difficulty and our unanswered prayer. What is on the other side, what is, on, is, is the, 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 the moment when we're taken to be with Jesus and there is no more sorrow or suffering or pain or difficulty for the old order is taken away. And he says, well done. And you hear me talk about this lots, but I am strongly motivated by two things about, three things about, four, no, three, three things about heaven. Firstly, there's no tears. Secondly, that God would say, well done. And thirdly, that he would say, not only well done, but here are the people who in part are here because of you. And we can all have that experience if we remain faithful, if we pray, if we live with integrity. And when it's tough, and when we feel like giving up, and when we're not sure, and when we complain because the church wasn't what we wanted it to be, or the people weren't what we wanted it to be, we say, yeah, but whatever happens, I will not give in. Because when you lose 5 nil away at Morecambe, and you travel back in the rain, then the moment that you beat Morecambe 5 nil is all the better. No disrespect to Morecambe, but it's true. We need to expect difficulty but focus on reward and we choose now to keep going. In other words, we make a decision before God which we're going to do in our worship now, in our time together. And we choose to say, God, I will follow you. I used to sing a lot, the, 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 the chorus, Abba, Father, let me be yours and yours alone. Never let my heart grow cold. That was my anthem. Sang it all the way through uh, being a, a young adult again and again on my own. Lord, let, never let me go. Asking for help isn't giving up, said the horse. It's refusing to give up. The question for reflection is a difficult one. It's one we've asked before, but I want to ask it again. Are we following Jesus for what he can do for us or what he, we can do for him? Because if we follow Jesus for what he can do for us, we will fall away. but we need to follow him for what we can do for him, which is what gives us real life. I'm going to play you a great uh, gospel song. may not necessarily be your kind of music, uh, <laughs> but it's a, I love it. And I want to show you the words. I want to show you why I've chosen it. Uh, the singer says this, I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. And I just love that phrase. I'm coming up on a difficult path. I'm coming up the wrong way and it's hard. I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. I must hold to God his powerful hand. I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. I'm doing my best to make it in. And I love this idea of this person scrambling off the, the wrong way and it's difficult and it's painful. And they're saying, I'm coming up. I'm coming up the rough side. Lord, I'm striving to make it through this barren land, but as I go from day to day, I can hear my Savior say, trust me, child, come on and hold my hand. You may feel you're going up the rough side of the mountain. The path isn't easy and it isn't straight. And Jesus is there saying, come on, hold my hand. 
We're going to make it. This old race will soon be over. There'll be no more race for me to run. And I will stand before God's throne. All my heartaches will be gone. And I hear my Savior say, welcome home. Grant that we may cleave. Cleave means stick. Stick to you without parting. Worship you without wearying. Serve you without failing. Faithfully find you. Forever be possessed by you. The one, the only God. Blessed for all eternity.